Hello everybody, welcome back to another adventure in beekeeping. Troy Hall here with you. I'm gonna show you guys today how I will go uh, set up cell builders. Um, there's many ways to set up cell builders in regards to queen rearing. And uh, it's as diverse, I guess there's, a, there's some basic systems in place that, are, that work for a lot of people. Um, and I think the secret to queen rearing is really finding something that will work essentially on your, for your size and scope and scale of queen rearing and your schedule um, and to the degree in which you are um, kind of like what's your objective with the queens and again your schedule. For me I'm on a I run an eight-day cycle um, without confusing you guys too much um, so what, what essentially what I'm doing is every eight days I'm grafting every eight days I'm setting up another round of cell builders that I'll graft into into the future so there's this constant cycle of kind of preparing grafting distributing the cells out to uh, the, the mating yard every eight days, catching queens out of the mating nukes that'll be replaced with the queen cell. So there's a cycle and it's on an eight day cycle. Maybe in a future video, I'll show you guys what that looks like. But just for the sake of showing you uh, in, a, in, a, in a video today of how I set up cell builders, um, I'll show you guys how I do that. Essentially what I'm doing is using a starter finisher uh, uh, colony or starter finisher cell builder, starter and finisher, queen cell builder all in one. Um, I'm going to show you guys how, uh, how it kind of just, it's really simple once you get the idea of how it's done. But um, it's, it's a starter finisher all in one. We graft today, we'll graft into it. There's some nuances to this system that, are, uh, that I think are really important to pay attention to. Um, the one thing I like about this particular way of raising queen cells is that the risk in regards to weather um, and the workload is spread out over a few days. So it does kind of take up more of a footprint on your schedule when it comes to a calendar, but it, if, if done and followed regularly, it really is, works beautifully in a system where you're raising lots of cells and you want to have, um, let's say you're gonna raise, you know, hypothetically you wanna raise 50 queens, queen cells every, every week and you wanna do it over the course of the summer, this is a nice system to do that. If you're just looking to make some queen cells, um, actually this would work good too if you're just looking to make one batch of cells too. But I like this because it does spread the risk in regards to if we get a rainy day, you know, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket to do something on one day. You're setting up colonies, you're grafting into them, you're moving, you're doing this kind of work in the, on an eight day schedule, which mitigates risk for weather and for just exposure to other things as well. So hopefully this will all work out and we'll show you guys how, it, how we do today or how I go through the process with setting up the cell builders, grafting and uh, going forward. Okay, so what we have here is a start of the, the start of the process for, for how I raise queens is I take a, a normal, healthy, strong colony that's situated nicely in two deeps. So obviously we got some honey supers on. Um, we start or we just we started putting supers on just uh, last week. Uh, but anyway, so we got honey supers on and a strong colony situated in two deeps. For this to work out nicely, what I like to see is a is a colony with about eight to nine frames of brood. Um, that's a nice population to, to raise some cells. And with this method of, of, queen, of, cell, of, of cell building, you're only gonna raise one batch of cells per colony. This isn't a continuous um, cycle of like in another 28 days from now or 20, yeah, 28 days after these cells are done, I can come back in and, and raise cells again. So essentially I'm gonna go through this yard and each colony is gonna raise a round of cells. And then typically after about three weeks, I can come back to the first round of cell builders and repeat the process, because it does kind of zap the colony's energy a little bit when you raise cells this way. But it does a nice job, because the, the, these colonies do raise nice queen cells. Um, so essentially, what I'll do is 10 days ago, it's kind of like a cooking show where you, you, you pull a cake out of the oven, you know, you mix the batter, pour the batter in the pan, and then instant, you know, you got this nice cake that they just reach out and say, well, before a schedule, ahead of plan, or ahead of schedule, we made this cake. So it's kind of like that today with queen ring or with cell building. 10 days ago, which is an important thing to note, 10 days uh, ago, I found the queen in, the, in this colony and confined her in the bottom deep below a queen excluder. Uh, the this, this trick is, is that this top box, which, we're gonna, which will be our cell builder, has to be void of eggs, larvae, uh, pretty much eggs and larvae. You want cat brood, emerging brood, um, 
and you don't want any, any ability for these bees to raise queens uh, on their own. So you remove the ingredients that they can raise queens from and you have an environment essentially where you're uh, hope helplessly queenless. So that's what we're going to do today. So the important thing, uh, if you wanted to emulate this, this, this uh, process is pick a, pick a day on the calendar or on your schedule you want to graft. Ten days before you graft, come into your apiary, find your queen, move her in the bottom box with the queen excluder, you know, it's separating the brood chamber so she's in the bottom. Another important thing to consider or not consider but to follow is you need to remove any queen cells, cups with eggs, larvae, Obviously, if you've got cap cells, make sure that they hadn't swarmed yet, but you need to remove any queen cells in that process of, of when you put the queen below the excluder on that first day. So then 10 days, which we are here today, 10 days later, I'm back to actually graft. So what I'm going to do is go to the brood nest, cull any cells that they've developed or started to raise in the process of, of the 10 days that have gone by, and then uh, I'll show you guys the next step and how we move the queen off of this, get off of this colony to, to situate the bees so that they're queenless. The trick here is to provide nutrition, so pollen. There's enough pollen coming in. I, I don't feed pollen patties, anything like that this time of year. So we got bee bread and pollen coming in. Um, and a little bit of, today I'm gonna provide them with a little bit of syrup, because there's a little bit of a flow, but the syrup will just kind of guarantee that they get something, especially like tomorrow it's gonna rain. So they at least they'll have something to kind of constantly stimulate them to, to draw out the cells and do a good job with it. So let's go on to the next step. Okay, so as we start to get into this colony, uh, the steps that I kind of go through, obviously I use queen excluders in my operation, so all my honey supers are, are uh, void of queen, so it's nice, my, in a sense, for looking for queen cells, anything above your excluder is not really an issue to worry about, you know, their, their, uh, the bees raising cells. So what I'm gonna use is this first honey super that's got nectar, uh, ma mainly from dandelion and some apple that's been in, you know, we've had a pretty big run on dandelion and uh, there's, an or well, there's plenty of apples, both wild and uh, uh, propagated apples here that the bees make a little bit of honey from. So regardless, there's some, there's some nectar up in the super. I'm gonna use this super as the bottom to go right on the hive stand uh, for, the, for the cell builder, which I'm gonna move right over here. So this goes on the bottom, a new bottom board. And then in this case, here's my cell builder, is this top deep. We're gonna uh, leaf through these combs real quickly. I wanna make sure that they have no, um, no queen cells. So we wanna mitigate their ability to raise queens on their own and, and so that they accept the cells that we're gonna give them or the grass we're gonna give them today nicely. So essentially what I wanna do at the same time is remove two frames. Um, I wanna make a space for the graft. So I'm gonna pull out usually this first frame which is mostly nectar, capped honey and bees. I'll shake this in. Put this over here. What I like to do is find a frame of, this time of year in this part of the world, it's really easy to find frames of pollen. Um, and that's what I wanna make sure I have pollen. And the trick for the pollen frame that goes next to the graft is that it's not turned into bee bread yet. You want pollen that doesn't have a glaze of honey over it. It's freshly packed uh, into the combs by the bees. Or, you know, in the case, if you don't have any of this and you trap pollen and you wanna dump pollen granules onto the comb and press it into your finger uh, with your fingers, that's another nice substitute, you know, when the pollen flows subside or stop altogether. But in the spring, this time of year, um, pollen is so uh, easy to come by in the colonies that I rarely have to, to, uh, to give any sort of frames of pollen. I do have, I can show you guys, I got some pollen, some bee bread, not bee bread, but combs of pollen. I don't know if you can get that up on the camera. It's like just like it's it's pa it's pollen that's uh, from last year that I was able to hold on to, um, and I'll use this these frames in case they, they don't have the pollen in the colonies. But there's a uh, there's a lot of questions that come up in my mind with using for older combs of pollen is, you know, the nutritional value of the pollen, how is that, um, and all that other stuff. But it seems to work and it seems to get decent cells uh, when I need them. So I have them. That's what I'm going to use today if I need to provide a frame of pollen. Or sometimes too, even the, most of the pollen's in the bottom box. So I'm, I'll, I'll get brave enough sometimes to pull out frames of pollen from the bottom box where the queen is, but you need to make sure there's no eggs in those frames. So you gotta just kinda really you know, know what you're doing before you just start moving frames up from the bottom box where the queen is to the top box, which will, which will be your cell builder. So in the process of doing this, I need to make sure that there are no, um, there are no queen cells, right? So I'm not seeing it. We've had some really interesting weather the last few days. We had a frost uh, 
two nights ago. Got to be, I think, 24 degrees. And there was a good hard frost, which killed off a lot of uh, stuff that was starting to flower and bloom. So the bees were kind of in this really, they were in this position to really have this impulse to swarm that was building up. And it's kind of been zapped from them a little bit with the uh, onset of that cold weather or that cold night that we had. But it looks like, so here's a cell. That's why it's always important to just be diligent and go over the combs and look for the queen cells that they want to, that they're trying to raise. All this is brood that's obviously hatching and emerging, so the pattern here doesn't look good. The queen hasn't been on these combs for 10 days. If you need to shake bees off, do that, because you need to get a good look at these combs. Sometimes they'll have a, you know, a comb right on the face of the brood, you know, a queen cell that's kind of encapsulated in with the worker brood. And unless you uh, shake bees, you really can't find those, and it's important to get them. Any queens emerging before your cells are ready will destroy your graft and it'll all be for naught. One thing about queen rearing that I have found is that it's crucial. There's a good frame of pollen. It's a little bit past what I'd like. This is a, a good example of bee bread. See how it's got the glistening kind of shine to it? That's a little bit past what I'd like to provide for a pollen comb. But if you're in a jam, this will work. I, you know, if you don't have, if this is the best you got, this is, this will work fine. There's another frame of pollen. Again, it's kind of starting to turn into bee bread. It's about like a 70-30 ratio of bee bread to fresh packed pollen. This side's all bee bread, but that side's got a little more pollen that there, that's not been converted yet. So what I'll do is I'll move, uh, I'll move the frame. I need to make room for the graft. So we got that and I'm going to move, actually this is a good frame for pollen. So I'm just going to put this right here in the, right up against the graft. If you have bad weather, so let's say today was going to be a really crappy rainy day. You, I could do all the, I call it preparing the cell builders, but you can do this work a day ahead if the day's nice, ahead of the graft day. So you get all the queen cells cold, make the space for the graft, put the pollen in where you're next to the graft, kind of get all this prepped. So then all you have to do is come in and kind of just situate this stuff. So you got your cell builder on the new stand, move the queen out of the way, shake some bees, wait a few hours and graft. Uh, it, you, so there's essentially some things you can do to, to spread, again, spread the workload around so that you um, don't have to do everything on one day. Because it's no fun doing this on, on bad weather days. So essentially, the queen is down here below the excluder. So now what I'm going to do is remove her from the stand over here. She's going to be over here for five days. You want a queenless... You want the whole thing to be without a queen for five days during the uh, process of the bees raising the queen cell. So then this is going to be the cell builder. You have a honey super, or not really, it's got a super with some nectar, hasn't been capped yet. Got the first deep of bees, void of any larvae and eggs. So right now this colony has no way to raise a queen on it by itself. I'm going to go into the queen right uh, colony and I'm going to shake four or five frames of nurse bees back into this scenario. And if I need to shake some bees from some other colonies to provide a little bit of a boost in, in population, I'll do that too. So um, we'll, come, we'll be back here in a minute and I'll show you guys what it looks like here in the next, in the next stage. Where is the... So you gotta be, this is the, obviously the box of the queen in it. So we will go through. This is the one that I also need to make sure we don't want queen cells in because when we reunite this colony uh, as a, essentially as a finisher, when I put the queen back below the excluder, if I have cells down here, they can swarm. And I don't want swarming because I'd like to produce some honey with these colonies as well. That's the nice thing about this is you can produce a nice little crop of honey still with this method. Lots of drones. I love how there's just a lot of drones and they're all just dark drones. Not a lot of color variation in this colony. 
The worker bees have a little more color, but the drones, they're pretty dark. I got eggs. So we know we got the queen. What I like to do is uh, you can use a shaker box to speed things up. But if I'm not, a, if not really pressed for too much time, I got the day to do this task, then what I'll do is I like to lay an actual visual on the queen. So what I'll do is I'll just go through and look for cells, queen cells, and the queen. And when I find her, I'll just set her aside. And then I will commence to shaking uh, the frames of nurse bees into the cell builder. I can't remember. If you start looking for marked queens all the time, you're setting yourself up for failure. So I just, you gotta be able to train your, your eye to looking for unmarked queens. And, uh, so you got cups, but is there, see these, they're extended enough. Is there any eggs in there? Yeah, so there's a cup with an egg. Essentially, to echo off of a lot of people that have made good videos on queen rearing, it's so, it's so, it works so much better if you can find colonies that already have a propensity to swarm. If you have to stimulate bees to swarm, to raise cells, you know, to use the swarming impulse to raise queen cells, it's just gonna go against you. The quality of the cells in the end is always gonna be less than what it could be if the bees naturally are inclined to raise the cells. So if doing this at a time of year when the swarming impulse is there, you as a beekeeper just need to do a few manipulations and everything works out to be, uh, to, to be the, the quality of your cells and enhance the quality of your queens are going to be superior. So raise queens during the time of year that the bees have an inclination or an impulse to swarm. I don't know how, you know, as far as like, you know, the, look, the three methods that queens are raised, right? It's swarming, supersedure, and emergency. It's hard to stimulate supersedure and it's no really, it's, it's probably not the best results for raising queens in a sense, for good quality queens under emergency situations. So it's, uh, as it's always been said before, it's really easy to stimulate bees to swarm. What do you do? You either you know, boost them with more bees and brood or wait for a colony to build up population and with nature providing food and resources, they naturally are inclined to swarm. So then you go forth in that t window of time when they have that, when they're stimulated to do this. Boy, I tell you, when you start talking and you're looking for cells and queens, uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, things slow right down. So good thing I, I kind of carved out the data to do this. So here we got another frame and on the face of the frame we got cups with eggs, no larvae. They got some jelly in there. So it's important again to cull those and I'm just, yeah, so I got eggs in here. So the queen's, she's around somewhere. And a lot of eggs in that, just all freshly laid up. We're hot on our trail. funny I've been seeing a lot of colonies where the brood is just like this all kind of synchronized and some colonies where there's just this generation of brood that uh, has all hatched out so you have a lot of your frames of brood that are all eggs and larvae and you don't kind of have this nice diversified brood nest where there's cat brood you know kind of that ratio of cat brood to um, eggs and larvae or what I would call open brood it seems like this the weather that we've been having over the last few days is kind of consolidated some of the, the ability for them to uh, just kind of go through these cycles of where there's just this consecutive, where there's just this, uh, sorry, I get distracted, I'm trying to find the queen. You just get these kind of batches of brood that come through. So there's all cat brood and then, and then it, uh, anyways, I guess my point is that there's not as much cat brood as I'd like to see, but there's some in and mixed amongst the pollen. Drones, where's the queen? Cups. Again, if you use a shaker box, you can do this really quickly. But there's something I, I've had plenty of times where Queens just kind of get lost in the process with shaker boxes, and if I'm if I'm not in a hurry, <clears throat> I will just go forth and try to find her in the bottom box here. All right. 
I might have to go back through these combs and see if I can find her. Or she's on the last frame. Let's see her. Oh, I overlooked her. I'll have to go back through real quick and give it the old once over. Three. Four. Got a visual on the queen, shaking five frames of, or four frames, one, two, three, four frames of bees. The nice thing about, or the one thing that I consider in doing this is not to shake too many bees from this colony with the queen because you want to make sure that for five days that this box has, with the queen has enough bees to take care of the brood. You don't want to completely zap them of all their ability to feed and have, make sure that the brood stays healthy. So in this case, I shook a little under half of the colony into the cell builder. Let's see, so this is the top super. Essentially, we don't have a huge flow going on right now. There will be once the honeysuckles just starting to flower, but I'm gonna put the top super, honey super back onto these guys. Just keep that out of the way. And this inner cover goes with this colony, or this colony, because this is where the my notes for the queen are. We'll put this cover back on here and we need an inner cover right here I got all this stuff scattered around for equipment inner cover so the trick here is you have this colony that's got the the bees the resources to raise queens now I want to wait give them a few hours that's the secret you want these bees to be really desperate and in the position so that when you drop your graft in that they should start getting to work raising cells for you um, that's that's the important thing to consider in all of this so we have to set up five cell builders today this is number one so we'll go through the process of getting the other four uh, set up like this give them a few hours come back i'm gonna graft show you guys what that's like if there's Nothing new of the way I do it. Uh, a lot of just, just basic grafting uh, with a good old fashioned Chinese grafting tool. Actually what I do have is some syrup. I'll get, the, get some syrup on these guys. This feeder cans are one gallon epoxy lined paint cans with a little bit of one to one or kind of a, a high, actually there's a ratio of water in here that's higher than one to one. It's like 1 1.5 or 1.25 to the balance being sugar. Oh, I forgot to bring the shims down. But the nice thing about this is you don't need, you just need some sticks. And you can provide a space for the feeder. Start the vacuum on that. And then I got some empty supers. And then that will go on that. All right, now we can wait. Wait a little bit, let them get good and desperate. So these are the first group I got everything marked out, so essentially, like, I, I actually set up the second group of cell builders already. I got everything marked on the covers, which is my first groups. So this is colony set up 10 days ago. Oh, look at morel mushrooms. It's interesting to see them growing. Let's see. Bring my bench over here. It's nice to have something where you're not constantly slumped over. Again, so what I want to do is set up so I have um, my bottom board. 
bring this over here too while I'm at it. Bottom board, inner cover, outer cover. Feeder. Super's a little heavy. We'll see what the bottom one. Usually I want to take the super that's got the little the most nectar or honey. That's this is all again. It's amazing at what they're able to do in just a shut such a short time. We just put these supers on, I think, a week ago. I put two on at a time, but I mean they're just filling it up. Not that it's they're not ready for any more, but they're doing a nice job filling these. So this will be the super that goes on the bottom, the new stand. bit of smoke. Pull this frame out to make space for the graft. We need to look, look for uh, any signs of them raising cells. So all this brood's emerged. It's all just empty comb. Empty drawn comb. Nice thing at this point in time, 10 days after you confine the queen below the excluder is that all your queen cells are going to be really easy to spot because they are, are going to be capped or mostly capped at this point. They're not going to be just cups. Um, it's just nice. I sometimes just go through and get rid of everything that resembles a cell. There's a nice frame of pollen. So we'll move this one towards the center of the nest of the super here to put next to the graft. Actually, we'll just leave it right there. A lot of empty real estate for a queen delay. Frame of honey, a little bit of pollen, and what it looks to like a frame of honey. I even go as far, you know, when you're just doing this, beginning to do this, check everything. Don't assume. The second you start assuming is the second you start overlooking a a queen cell that's on the side of a comb or heck I even seen if you had some burr comb on the interior of your supers there's a cup there with an egg or a cell that you'd overlook and that's the virgin that's going to emerge before your cells and you know kill off all your your grass so there's the cell builder let's see I'm just going to move this box over here for a second I'll put it up here and we'll relocate the queen. So I've been doing this for so many years now. It just becomes second nature to go through this process. I've done it in the rain, done it in the snow. <laughs> no, I haven't done it in the snow. I, I hope I never have to do it in the snow. If we get snow in May, then I guess it's uh, one of those years, but we typically this time of year, we get some frost still, but snow is for the most part all done with. So the queen excluder is going to come off for a moment because we need to shake bees out of that. If your drones are sexually mature, that's a good sign. Ten days from today, we will have ripe queen cells. It'll be 14 days old, and then we'll move these cells into the mating yard. And I guess for the sake of viewer entertainment, I can show you guys what the how it looks to set up all the mating nukes as they have come through the winter and we've removed most of the queens, the surplus queens, and made up splits and nukes and requeened a lot of hives that needed new queens. We'll begin to make up this year's round of uh, queen or uh, mating nukes with them. So again, bottom box, look for cells, 
cups with eggs, um, locate queen, shake frames of nurse bees back into the cell builder and uh, close them up, give them a few hours, come back with your graft and uh, I've, I'll graft one frame of 48 to 50 cells. I need 240 queen cells to uh, fulfill my uh, commitments, or not my commitment, but the numbers I need. I usually, if I have 200 cell builders, I always, you always want to overshoot the moon a little bit with raising queen cells because unless you're overly confident and uh, anytime you start to say, you know, you graft exactly what you need, you're probably going to fall short a few, especially as the season changes and the weather could change. So it's a safe thing to just always graft more than you need. And what's, what's it going to hurt? You know, you're just uh, going to take an extra five minutes or whatever it takes for you to graft a couple more cells and some, you know, and some people, for some people it might just be a few seconds to graft an extra 20 or 30, 30 or 40 seconds to graft a couple more cells just to hedge your numbers a little bit. But so essentially I need 200 cells, I'm going to graft 240. The surplus, you can always incubate, hatch virgins, or you have a surplus that just go to, go to waste. That often happens too. So, um, again, just kind of looking for the queen here. It's funny, combs where the queen is laying and uh, where there's brood being raised just have a different vibe than combs, you know, where the queen has been excluded from or you just have a colony without a queen. The, 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 they just, the combs with larvae and eggs in them just it's an, I don't know how to describe it. It just looks like there's uh, productivity and, and there's uh, not this barren landscape that is kind of set up for raising brood and without the brood it just doesn't have the same feel. So it's nice that, you know, obviously queen excluders work so this queen's down below and segregated to this bottom box where all the brood is. Alright, I don't see her there. Again, lots of, I don't know if you can get that, Fred, but just lots of open brood. Lots of pupa, lar young brood, you know, larvae that's probably six, seven days old. And then obviously the larvae that's just about ready to cap. And a nice, nice, beautiful frame here with uh, what looked like a mouse chewed it out one winter and they've repaired it with drone comb, which is about textbook for how bees repair mice-ridden frames of wax foundations, but uh, I'm going to shake this. It's amazing how some of these colonies are really dark and then it's like the queen goes through like these batches of semen within her spermithica that she stores up, there she is, um, and then all of a sudden you know you'll get these phases of the colonies, the phenotypes are kind of change and it just it's fascinating to think you know maybe the, the semen's just kind of going through this phase of dark bees and then more, you know, yellow or rusty colored bees on, in my case. So there she is. She's a white dot, so she is a two-year-old queen. And we'll just go ahead and shake some bees.